One of the biggest concerns many consultants have as they're trying to figure out projects, you know, scope projects, write contracts is how can deals go wrong? And obviously deals can go wrong at nearly any stage, right? They can go wrong at the beginning and projects can completely fall apart. Or, you know, as the project is going along, something could happen that completely blows it up and either you have to kind of end it or figure out how to deal with uh, legal issues, which luckily thus far I have not had to deal with, which is a great little uh, segue into a little bit about me. Hey there guys, my name is Ben Rogjan. I have been working as a data infrastructure and strategy consultant off and on for about five years and now I think full-time for about three. Uh, I was working at Facebook before this and now I this is what I do. I do data infrastructure consulting and someone uh, recently asked in the TFA group that I run, which is a group for technical consultants, which is free to join. So if you'd like to do that, feel free to click below, but we'll put up the question here where basically someone asked, you know, they love the content uh, in the group, but they want to know what didn't work and why have certain deals uh, fallen apart and basically the goal being how can they avoid some of these problems so in this video i wanted to share some of the uh, experience i've had when deals maybe didn't go as well as they should have and talk about some of the lessons you can pick up from that now uh one of the first problems that i've probably ever made and occasionally decide to make again uh, is not having a down payment before starting work this can totally blow up a deal because one you start doing work and then eventually, maybe you notice that you've got a net 30 terms, which just means they don't have to pay you for 30 days, which I generally don't like to do. I generally like to get some part of a down payment up front. But let's say you're kind to, to a company because you think they're big or whatever might be the reason. And now you're 60 days in and you haven't gotten paid. Well, now you've done work for 60 days. Now you're starting to get frustrated. Now you're angry. And again, these are all feelings and emotions that I've had. And now the project needs to be stopped. Honestly, it should have been stopped probably before. But you know, you were thinking it's coming. And so now it almost inevitably has a little bit of bad blood regardless, right? Because now you have to be direct. You have to send emails that very specifically state, hey, I sent you an invoice on this date. We have these terms in the contract. It, to some extent, it is business, right? And you're just, it's just how business runs. But now you're having to be more upfront. And again, I've had this happen uh, now at least two times and it's not a fun experience, right? And I have had to close projects because of it where I'm like, hey, look, I don't want to do the rest of this project. You know, I'm going to ask you to pay me what I'm due. Uh, so I don't have to go through legal issues, you know, make it very clear that that's not what the route you want to do. Um, and then the rest of the projects, I, I don't really want to work on it because you clearly can't figure out this problem. And, and that's just sometimes uh, the route you have to take. But yeah, now the deal is kind of blown up. You've lost money, at least money you could have earned. But at the very least, you've got a little bit more sanity back because you're not having to chase someone down for a bill or an invoice. And so I think that's one way a lot of deals can get blown up is just the finances aren't set up correctly in the beginning. My per personal recommendation there, and usually 95% of the time, the way I operate is payment should come first. Um, whether that's half payment, it depends on how big the project is. Like maybe you just do one month ahead of time. And then everything after that can be net 30 because it just makes you feel comfortable. Like it makes me feel very uncomfortable. The fact that I have to work 30 days before I even get my first cent of payment. So I prefer getting paid up front for the first month or maybe half the project, depending on the size. And in my experience, most companies have been happy with that. Now, another project that didn't necessarily go uh, wrong, it actually, we completed the project, but you know, didn't go as smooth as I wanted, uh, was one where I didn't realize one of the assumptions I had to have was I would be able to actually code. And what I mean by that is I was working for an industry or for a company in an industry that was highly regulated, specifically casinos. And I was having to write code for machines that were essentially directly touching data and information that has to do with a lot of the gambling machines that exist. And generally, you can't do that directly, which I, again, couldn't. I was not allowed to directly write code against these machines and instead had to essentially have a proxy, another person, implement my code, which I bet you can imagine is very painful to do because you can't really test anything. You're kind of having to understand <laughs> some systems, some level of firewalls and how all this stuff interacts with each other on someone else's system, which was worse because they had four different on-prem locations with different servers that had set up four different systems. And in each of those cases, I had to have someone else that I basically had to play a little game of operator where I was like, hey, can you type this code? Can you run this script? Can you show me the output? Can you show me the log? And it just made the work so much worse. And that was one of those examples where I was really glad I did uh, pricing on the hour because it was just so chaotic. But it is a good point uh, to think about that sometimes depending on the industry, you may or may not be able to actually even write the code against the system. So if you are in more highly regulated systems or, or industries, make sure you understand what the rules of engagement are, how you can actually, you know, maybe write code or if you can't write code, because that can be a little bit of a pain. I mean, for my side, obviously 
you can just build more hours, which I'm not saying you want to just build tons of hours, but at least you are getting compensated for it. But again, it's very frustrating. Um, so as you're writing your contract, especially if you're doing a project based contract, just consider writing that assumption in there, which is part of the contract. I generally put some level of assumptions of this is what I will be able to do um, for this price. Because if I can't write code personally, that obviously majorly impacts the time of the project. Now, the third issue that I've run into, and again, I said deals can blow up at any part of your discussion. And this is earlier in often the phases when you're just starting out, you know, maybe prospecting, talking to someone. And one of the first mistakes that a lot of us make is we often uh, fail to confirm the budget. That is to say, Maybe we're already thinking in our head, this project is $200,000. We're going to make tons of money. I mean, we're going to have a lot of value, but we think it's worth $200,000, right? But maybe in the other person's head, they only have a budget of $75,000. And you have not already confirmed that at some point in the process. Whether that is just you bringing up that, hey, projects like this cost, you know, 200 to 150K. Give them that range so they can swallow it and understand the sooner you do that, arguably the better, just so that they understand like what they should be thinking. A lot of us, I think, are scared because we're worried they're gonna run away. But if they're gonna run away from a number, you've just saved us on time, right? So don't worry about that. Or you fail to get someone on the line that could actually get more budget, right? Maybe the only person that you have online uh, is a senior analyst or someone who can't really get more budget. Maybe they think they have $50,000. But if you were talking to a VP, that VP knows how to get $200,000. And if you could tell them and show them how your project is going to be valuable, they will find that money, right? And so it's very important to confirm your budget and make sure you have the right people on the call. That way you don't go through the process of writing an entire contract, which again, this is kind of what I've had to, I've done multiple times. Uh, you know, you write an entire contract, you get to the number and people are like, oh, that's more than I thought, right? Because I was too scared to just say the number earlier. So try to get the number out earlier. If you have to, the way... You can do it is what I often talk about in the TFA, which is just do the three proposal method. It's usually two or three proposals, which is after your initial call or initial two or three calls, send a bolded list of proposal one, proposal two, proposal three, one's highest, one's lowest, and what you can offer. This uh, one avoids you having to actually say the number because that's probably where a lot of us feel awkward. We don't like saying a big number. And two, gives the other person the ability to see that, hey, you have options and you don't have to pick the most expensive one. And that way you don't put all your effort into building out a complex contract that then gets rejected, but also you've given them options and more likely increase the likelihood that you actually close a deal. Another issue in terms of not necessarily blowing up a deal, but just issues that I've run into specifically around training. So trainings is a great way for consultants to make money because generally for a, you know, eight hour period, you probably charge $5,000, $10,000, depending on if you're going through a third party or not. If you're going through a third party, like someone else is asking you to create a course or a training session, but they're like a middle company that really is just selling the deal, you'll probably get a lot less. But if you're the person selling the deal for an eight hour session, you can easily make $1,000 an hour, depending on, on the size and the impact of the work. Obviously, you're going to do some work behind the scenes. So maybe it ends up being more like uh, $500 an hour. But if you can resell that training, then it can get closer to that $1,000 an hour. But the problem is, if you don't confirm the audience, which again, this has happened. I've done plenty of trainings. But in one case, I just didn't confirm the technical abilities of the audience. And so I gave the first draft of what I was planning to do. And the people that I was going to give it to and then give the talk to were, I can just say, unhappy. They, they were like, this isn't what we want at all, right? Like, it's too technical. It's not what we need. You know, I thought I'd already kind of brought it up a little bit, but really they needed some baseline concepts explained because they're like, some of these people don't understand things like the cloud or even things that you might consider very basic. And so it's very important to understand who is your audience? Where do they fit? Where do they have knowledge gaps? So if you're going through training and you're planning a training, Really try to ask those questions. Don't just understand what the training is. Understand who you're giving it to and where their gaps are in knowledge because that's really important. You need to figure out, hey, what don't they know, right? Because there's some big problems that they might not know and you need to understand what they are so that you can cover them as you're giving this conversation. Finally, the last uh, issue that I've, I've run into where I've kind of cut a deal in the middle was when I came into a data stack and I kind of knew it was going to be a problem. Like it was just way too complex. Like when they explained it to you, I'm like, wow, this sounds like a very painful data setup. Right? I'm saying data stack, but it was all very, 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 very custom. You know, they were just using every open source tool out the book, which nothing wrong with that. But just the way they had set it up was already concerning me when they brought up Kubernetes. Uh, for data infrastructure, I kind of got why they did it, but just the way they had set it up, 
I realized would be just so complex to deal with that after I finally, you know, after we signed the contract and I looked at it, I was just like, after about a month, I was like, you know, I thought I would make this work, but this is going to be more work than it's worth um, for original contract. So I appreciate your time, but we're gonna have to just, you know, cut this short. And I think sometimes that happens. Like I kind of knew it ahead of time when they told it to me. So sometimes you have to just trust your gut. Like if you kind of feel like a client's gonna be difficult to work with and they're already being difficult um, on your pre-screening calls, if a, you know, what they're explaining in terms of technology doesn't make sense. There's a lot of places that you kind of get this gut feeling that this is not gonna be a project worth your time. It's probably a project that's going to be a pain. Obviously, if you're just getting started, you likely have to just accept it to some degree. But the more experience you get, the more likely you'll be able to push these projects away or maybe just confirm exactly what you will and won't do. With that, I hope this was helpful in helping you understand how projects and deals as you're consulting can go wrong and how you can hopefully avoid some of those issues. With it, guys, I want to say thanks so much for watching and I'll see you all in the next one. Thanks all. Goodbye.